Welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of meeting culture and uncovering cures for the common meeting. Some meetings have tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly magical meeting. This episode is brought to you by Mural, a digital workspace for visual collaboration. At Voltage Control, we use Mural to facilitate engaging and productive meetings and workshops from anywhere. Mural gives teams the means, methods, and freedom to collaborate visually. Use their suite of facilitation superpowers to control the virtual room and solve tough problems as a team with their pre-built templates and guided methods. To see for yourself why companies like IBM, Atlassian, and E-Trade rely on Mural, start your 30-day trial at mural.co. That's M-U-R-A-L dot C-O. Today, I'm with Kaleem Clarkson, co-founder and chief operating officer of BlendMe Incorporated. He is a remote employee experience professional and developing Remotely One, a community for location independent professionals. Welcome to the show, Kaleem. Douglas, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I, I hear this crowd applause in the background. Let's get that in post-production. I love it. Yeah, awesome. So, Kaleem, I'm really curious to hear how a employee experience professional gets their start. How do you find your way on this path? That's a good question. I probably should have this ready by now. But So, I, I guess I'll start my my origin story. I guess this is my origin story. So, born and raised in Bangor, Maine. I'm going way back. Bangor, Maine, I represent. I always love to throw it out. My home state, I love it. But uh, I ended up going to college in Massachusetts. Got a chance to play uh, at Worcester State University. Got a chance to play some some college football there. And during that time, we all had a very good time. Let's, let's, Let's put it that way. I enjoy having beverages with people making sure that everyone else is having a good time. And, you know, we ended up throwing a, a good amount of gatherings, should you say, in college. And um, started getting into a, a metal band, believe it or not. Just got into a metal band and started rocking out. Loved the stage, loved, loved that whole feel to it. And, you know, that led me to starting a, a nonprofit organization called Concerts for Charity. Jeez, I think we started in... 99 and uh we started putting on different concerts with different charities across new england we got our 501c3 status and started donating to different charities and we got to work with a a lot of cool cool bands in in, in different areas you know a lot of jam bands um a lot of hard rock bands we work with uh geez i'm trying to think of some bands that we've booked in the past Uh, i think we we booked blind melon on their comeback tour which was pretty cool Chick, Chick, Chick out in Sacramento, I remember back in the day. Um, I think we booked uh, Slick Rick, a rapper. Uh, if you don't know some of you old, old school folks. Colleague of Dougie Fresh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. And you know what was funny is, you know, we wouldn't pick them up at the airport or whatever. And he gets in the car and, you know, total British accent, you know. So, you know, you don't <laughs> think about that. Like, dude's been living in England all these years and gets in. He's like, hello, and, you know. Horrible British accent, <laughs> by the way. That's horrible. But anyway, yeah. So we, I got a chance of doing that. And that was really kind of my first experience with dealing with virtual volunteers. Um, volunteer match at the time, we ended up um, connecting with the Warp Tour and were able to register people to vote through a group called Headcount as well. And anyway, it was great. It was a cool experience. We got to do a documentary that, that featured uh, Tran Nostalgio from Fish and um, Bob Weir from the, the Grateful Dead and, and Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones, a really big, big artist in the jam band scene. And we got to debut it at HBO. So it was it was cool. I was probably only, what, 21 years old, 22 years old. I really got my first taste of putting on events and just kind of sitting back and, and, and watching everybody having a good time. And I think that's the common theme, right? Like everyone was just having a good time. Everyone has that cup and that red solo cup and that really cheap beer, but everyone's having a good time generally. And uh, yeah, so I, I kind of move on, move to Atlanta, my partner and I, and get a job at Kennesaw State University at um, Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And that's like a faculty development center. They basically teach faculty how to teach. 
I don't know if you knew that, you know, a lot of people may not know this, but, you know, college professors, they graduate with a PhD and they're put right in the classroom so that, you know, they don't go through any teaching training or anything like that, a lot of them. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it was cool. I got to put on a lot of international conferences there. there. Then again, I'm putting on parties again, right, except in a different setting. <laughs> that was the, kind of the interesting or educational piece to me. I didn't realize, you know, faculty also enjoy having a good time, and they do. <laughs> so, yeah, all these professional conferences got a chance to put some of those on and really kind of just didn't even realize that, you know, last I was there for, for, for 10 or 12 years. And I would have to say in 2012, I believe, um, you know, during my work at Kennesaw, I got heavily involved with the Drupal community. And Drupal is an open source website application tool, kind of like WordPress, build websites with it. So kind of got involved with, with that community. And again, that was an, another experience of being with like-minded people. It was outside of my previous uh, experience of concerts in the entertainment industry and then getting into higher ed around faculty in the higher ed industry. Well, now I'm around other, you know, computer digital marketers and digital professionals, you know, developers. And yeah, I got heavily involved with Drupal and started building websites and and, and uh, kind of became a, a Drupal developer. And last year, uh, probably a year and a half ago, yeah, like a year I got left higher ed and decided to um, get involved with a company called Oomph and as a UX engineer and, and started doing some front-end development work. But the cool thing about Drupal and open source is, again, the networks of people that you meet. And during that time, um, I think it was it was 2012, that I was at a, a, a conference in, in Denver, DrupalCon Denver, and I heard a, a talk by, his name is Matt Westgate from a company called Lullabot. Uh, they're a big development firm. I think they did the Grammys website and some other big ones. But anyway, yeah, I went to that talk and he he was talking about um, how to how to run a virtual organization, and he he talked about why they weren't using the word remote and why they were using the word distributed and how those words what those words actually could mean to people. And I recall him saying, you know, remote felt like you were distant from something. Mm -hmm. You were away from a, a group of people. So it was fascinating. Like at that time, 2012, it seems like, you know, a hundred years ago, but there weren't very many people talking about how to work remotely. So I came home and my partner, she had graduated two years before that in 2010 with her master's degree from, from UConn in organizational development. And she actually wrote her master's paper thesis on virtual volunteerism because my charity had hooked up with the Warp Tour and we had virtual volunteers all over the country. So I came home from that and, and I was talking with Jen and I said, I think we found something. I think I think we should do our own thing. And um, she, she was all about it. She, you know, she was looking for strategic HR jobs and there weren't very many people love those jobs, by the way. All you VP of people and CHROs of people, they don't they don't really leave those jobs because those jobs are those are they're great. You know, strategic HR is obviously a much bigger thing now. So we just decided to create Blend Me Inc. You know, I you know I, I kind of took care of the marketing, and then she would take care of the engagement, and that's how we kind of came up with the name. So she worked for a while at a company that was all distributed, and you know we we kind of did some consulting on the side with some diversity and inclusion. And at the end of the day, you realize all of your experiences are kind of what together are, are who you are. And I was very fortunate in that I had been at companies for, you know, I was at Kennesaw for a very long time, 11 years. And it was because we had a great time. And now if I'm looking back, you know, you asked me the origin question of how do you become a, employee experience professional, you just look back and think about all of the situations and the moments you had that were special with a special group where you accomplished big goals. We accomplished a lot of great things there. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that we were all having a, a really, really good time. So this year with, with COVID, you know, I decided that it's time to go full time, that we no longer had that obstacle of, of proving to people that remote work, you can be uh, productive 
Like that, that ops, that was, has always been an obstacle. And, and honestly, what we decided from day one, 2012, when we were looking at writing our mission statement, we said we did not want to work with agencies that wanted us to prove that remote work was the right answer. We didn't want to get into that type of work because it trying to prove to somebody that, no, you could do this. It's just not really, you know, we want to help people that are already have already kind of gone over that hump or already believe that it can be successful. Because if it's not, if, if there's not a belief from the, from the very top all the way through the organization, it doesn't come through as authentic. So what's, what's interesting is, is, you know, for all these years, there's been a very small market. But I firmly believe, and I think we can all agree, that from 2000, March of 2020 on, I don't think any any manager, well, in certain industries, I shouldn't say that, but I'm going to say in 90% of, of jobs today that we have, you know, behind a desk or in an office, it's going to be very difficult for managers to say that you're not productive. So yeah, that's the whole origin story. I think I got it in like eight minutes. You got to work on cutting it down a little bit, but yeah, that's how we kind of came to this point. Yeah. And I really want to dig in on the definition of remote versus distributed and you know even virtual is kind of mixed in there as well i ran into this when when i was first venturing out on my own and kind of exploring this kind of concept of fractional cto and and at first i was calling myself a virtual cto and someone asked me it was a junior developer they said um so does that mean you're it's all in the cloud (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so I thought maybe this word virtual is not a good fit here. <laughs> but, you know, that story or that notion of misinterpretation of the word virtual is I mean, exactly what you're getting at around remote versus distributed. And, and I think that a lot of those notions really held us back. But now that everyone's been thrust into this experience where they've been forced to uh, you know, grapple with it to wrap their hands around it. And they're starting to to understand that there there are some benefits, and things maybe aren't as bad as they might imagine. Absolutely, and you know, it's what really the difficulty with our industry. And when I say our, I just mean remote work or telework industry. Is that we don't have an association now. I, I know Laurel Farrell has just created the Remote Work Association, and I give her kudos to that and. I believe, uh, you know, um, what's her name from Flex Job? Sarah, Sarah, um, can't remember her name, but it's, but you know, the start of Flex Jobs, they created the 1 million person March campaign. There's been different like spin off campaigns, but one thing that I've learned from higher ed is when you have, uh, uh, you know, the National Society for Statistics, Mathematics and Statistics. You know, that's an, that's an organization that has, that spits out all that, the knowledge. When you have SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management, or you have these, you know, major field associations, there's research, there's, there's guidance, there, there are definitions, there are thought leaders. And for, for me and for us, when we were trying to talk to clients about the different types of remote work, quote unquote, we just, always got stuck. You know, me having that thought of, well, let's, let's find the history and realizing that, oh, okay, well, outside of the U.S., a lot of countries use the term telework. The government agencies use the word telework. You know, there's a telework guidance guidelines for the, for the government. Well, before, but I'm pretty sure that they still exist somewhere. So then we were struggling with that. So for us, we just figured, okay, we need to come up with our own definitions for when we're working with clients. And we wanted to, to, to show homage to, you know, Jack Niles for coming up with the word telework in 1973. It's kind of a little outdated definition, but we just kind of felt like, okay, all of these different things are telework. And when we were thinking about the different types, we realized that a lot of the terms are related to a central workplace. So for us, what we decided to do was come up with our own definitions. And here we go. We call them Telework's big three, right? So we kind of go with all of its telework. But a distributed company doesn't have a centralized workplace. 
So when we're talking with our clients, they're like, oh, yeah, we're a remote company. We don't have an office. We'll say, okay, well, for our purposes, you know, when we're in our meetings and when we're talking about the programs that we have, you know, we're going to we're going to refer to your agency as a distributed company because you don't have a centralized workplace. So employees, you know, they work from wherever they're the most productive and the most comfortable. So that's that's distributed. Then we came to the common word of remote. And what drove us to this was back to that 2012 talk of the reason why they don't use the word remote was because it felt like you were away from the centralized workplace. Well, all of that was 100% distributed. They didn't have a central workplace. But remote employees are away from a centralized workplace. So to me and to us, when we're talking to, not to me, but when we're internally speaking, Remote employees are, are people who work away from the office. So you have a centralized office. There are people that are going into the office every day, but you also have some remote employees. So that's how we kind of label that. And then our last one is kind of like the telecommuter, telecommute. You know, telecommute employees share their time between a central workplace and working wherever they feel comfortable. So to us, that's kind of how we've broken it down. It'd be awesome if everybody out there in the whole remote workspace would say, hey, this is great. Let's all agree to this. As far as, you know, posting social media, remote work is very popular, the term remote work. And, you know, we're kind of still in that space as well. So we understand. But when we're internal, I kind of feel like that there are definitely differences. Another word that we've seen before to replace kind of remote employees or maybe hybrid. You know, we've heard people talk about a hybrid setup and, you know, hybrid setup means, you know, half the people are in a central workplace and half the people um, are not. So I important. I wish I, I hope somebody steps up and, and maybe um, the remote work association will be that governing body for all of us where we can all, you know, post our research to and, and, and be a place. For right now, I guess we'll use the term remote work when we're talking to the rest of the world and just try to clarify the differences between the, the different types because there's a major difference in, in communication facilitation and, and how you're going to manage your team based on the types of telework that, that you're implementing. Absolutely. And I would imagine that the tactics would be quite different and maybe even the programs which um, you might use to, to address the concerns or the needs. So, when you think about these three, this taxonomy, when you're working with clients, is there is there one category that you find is most popular? Yeah, there's no doubt that what we call remote or quote unquote hybrid is the most popular, especially like today. You know, so it's kind of a difficult question because it's like, well, are you talking about before or after? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so before, let's just talk about before. Um, before, and I'm saying, just so you, the world knows, I'm talking about before COVID-19, okay? Um, before COVID-19, I would say there were definitely more hybrid companies or remote companies where they had people working in an essential uh, workplace and some people working remotely. Telecommuter, it's kind of, you know, I would say a lot of agencies allow their people to work from home a couple times. So I would say definitely between, you know, telecommute agencies that let you work from home a couple times a week and the hybrids were by far the most popular. And what, what do you think folks are learning as they're shifting a bit as far as, you know, their ability to set those, the frequency at which people um, were remote? You know, they went from, you know, being a part-time somewhat sometimes kind of thing to being a full-time thing. and I'm sure you've you've seen them kind of struggle from because I would imagine some of the practices and approaches they were using, let's say the weaknesses maybe started to show more once they started to lean more heavily into it. And so I'm curious what you noticed as folks have been forced to be more remote. What have they noticed that broke down? Like what, what was no longer working for them? And I'm interested from from a pattern standpoint, like what's what's been consistent across most of your conversations? Like, what are you hearing that's like been kind of a, a very common issue that's been breaking down for folks as they have become more remote? There's no doubt it's 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 been communication. 
we kind of used to brand ourselves as an internal marketing agency, and we still do a lot of internal marketing. Um, but there's no doubt that the communication has been one of the biggest breakdowns because you weren't set up to do this. One of the things that we talk about when you're designing your employee experience is, you know, you have to look at it from the day they look at your job ad to the day that they are departing. And if you don't have a plan, and you know this with meetings, if you don't have an agenda, right, or you don't have like a set of goals that are intentional, then though then your your product's not going to most likely be as good. And it, and that that goes for the same thing with with internal communication and, and doing remote work. The ones who are struggling are the ones who did not have good internal marketing practices in place. The organizations who are struggling are the ones who don't trust their employees. You know, the ones who are really having a tough time are the ones who did not take on the responsibility of providing enough resources, enough training, enough documentation to allow you to be distributed now. So it's really interesting to see the companies who haven't even missed a beat a lot of the Drupal companies in the web development space, you know, I'm learning a lot of this, you know, the culture and the practice and stuff from, from some of these companies that are going on. You know, that talk that I'm telling you about is 2012. Another company, Four Kitchens, I mean, they've been, they're another Drupal company. They, they've been distributed now for, geez, probably five, eight years. And the company I work for, they've, they've had distributed people. So, the organizations who are not having a challenge at all are the ones who are already prepared to be remote already. So, you know, just to kind of reemphasize, the the ones who did not have their internal communications strategy set up are the ones who are struggling the most. There's no doubt. Yeah, and so what are the hall- hallmarks of a good internal marketing program, or what? How do we m- bolster those communication plans? Whew. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a deep one. That's a deep one. So just not just internal marketing. I probably shouldn't say the ones who didn't have the internal marketing plan, but more along the lines of you didn't have your whole employee experience plan down because like you can have the best internal marketing set up, but if you haven't explained how your culture works or what your culture is like, you know, a remote employee can't feel that. So I, I guess I should say, you know, yes, internal marketing is critical because it's part of communication. That's a huge piece. But in the whole employee experience, there are a lot of a lot of steps. And I would say like um, Gallup, for all you researchers out there, Gallup, we've been quoting Gallup a long time for all of the awesome research they've done on remote work, how many people work remotely, what the they're one of the best that have been producing it. They kind of came up with this great diagram of what the employee employee experience is like. I'll just kind of go through those different spaces because internal marketing kind of fits kind of within these things, right? So th- their first their first thing that they talk about is um, is attract. You know, how is your job description written? Does it reflect uh, the type of people? that work at your agency and are you attracting the type of people that you want to be at your agency? So what's your culture statement look like? Do you have a page that talks about your culture? Do you meet every single day? Is it more of a Netflix work 90 hours a week type culture? Are you more like work whenever you feel comfortable? So that's important that your, your website set up, right? Then you got to hire is your hiring practice matching what you've already talked about, you know, um, you know, are you interviewing with multiple people in the teams? Are you meeting those people? Are you, you know, do you have a chance to um, talk to the culture club or, or, or people outside of your team instead of just your team? Then you have to onboard the people. So now you're only at step three. Onboarding and onboarding alone, a very, very thorough onboarding program can be up to 18 months. You know, you're talking about, okay, you got, you have your 30, 60, 90 day reviews, right? And then, you know, you... You have to kind of establish what your goals kind of were. So like onboarding could be long. Then you have engagement. You got to make sure your employee is engaged. So you have engagement pieces. Then you have to set up. You go to performance. You got to make sure your performance evaluations are set up correctly. 
make sure that everybody understands what is expected of you to be successful at that organization. And then you have to develop them, right? And then they depart at some point. So in this huge, like this huge step of like seven steps of the whole employee experience, what we realized for remote work is that you have to have trust. Like trust is even more critical. Trust is even more critical because, you know, are you an agency that is going to, you know, try to have a piece of software that takes snapshots of your individuals every 90 seconds? Or are you a results only type agency that cares more about the results and understands that, hey, with school the way it is in some places, people may not be able to work all day. You know, people may have to work at a different time. So trust is critical. And then, you know, we kind of talked about responsibility earlier. You have to have, you know, to, to work remotely, there's a sense of responsibility both on the employee and on the employer. It's a very two-way street. So, like, this whole whole thing is kind of what is is, is the pillar of the, the remote employee experience, kind of something that we're kind of labeling as tree, <laughs> trust and responsibility. In order for you to, to get that set up, you just have to start at the beginning and you have to be intentional of what it is that you're trying to accomplish in each step. So, you know, I know it didn't answer your question specifically about like, what are some of the pillars in, in, in establishing a good internal marketing strategy? But, you know, I just kind of wanted to really emphasize that you need to think about this whole thing and not just the internal marketing side. You have to think about this whole thing because now we don't have those office places that people can talk to and interact with. You know, um, now people are ver- distributed, you know, behind a computer. So you really, you really have to think about the whole, the whole spectrum. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, what does that journey the employee is taking and, and how can you kind of meet them at various moments in that journey with intention? Yeah, yeah. And we're just seeing it right now the, the, the groups who really, really, really care about their employees, you know, that are what we like to say is we like to work with agencies who are culture driven. And to us, what that means is, listen, we all we all want to make money. I kind of feel like people trip sometimes when, you know, you talk about we care about people, or, you know, even nonprofits, people look nonprofits make money, people. You know, just so you know this, and I used to tell people about this all the time, a nonprofit is an I, a 501c3 is an IRS designation. All that means is that entity does not have shareholders. Charities make profits. You have to make, your business has to make profits to be sustainable. So with all of that said, we work with agencies who, who are culture driven, meaning that, yes, we could make more money, but we'd, we'd rather maybe only make a little less money and put culture first because we understand that it's, it's it's a marathon, right? Like we understand that if our employees are happy, it's going to just make our situation a lot better. So I think one thing I like to like to talk about is culture driven agencies. Yeah. I like that. This notion that that's a, that's a priority and a, and a focus for the leadership. So I want to talk a little bit about some tactics and, you know, something that we talked about, uh, or that I noticed in some of some of our pre-show exchange was around the use of Google Docs and and how you can um, as a remote tool use that to focus the team into a common task. So I'm, I'm just really curious, like around um, what what are some things that people can go do today? Whether it's like use Google Docs in this fashion, if you want to elaborate on that, or it could be any other tactic or or approach. But what's something that they can just go literally try out and improve their employee experience? All right. That's cool. I like that. I like that. So um, I'm just going to kind of go through each one of them. I think that kind of will make a little bit more sense in my brain. So the first thing that you can do to attract the type of employees that you want. I learned this actually with, with um, Inc. is they created a culture club, which I thought was pretty neat. Get some of your, your team together, make it voluntary and say, hey, you know what? We want to we want to kind of rewrite what our culture statement is like to better fit who we are today. And we want to kind of better illustrate what it's like to be a part of this team. 
I like to use team instead of family. Sometimes families, you know. Um, so yeah, what is it like to be a part of this team? So that you're attracting the right people. The other thing too is like to kind of attract some of those people that you're looking at. Get outside of your normal bubble and market yourself. What we, we love to say, I, I know I'm kind of talking about engage, but look for people that are going to add to your culture instead of culture fit. So we like to use the word culture add versus culture fit. Culture is great, but we all talk about why is culture great aside from the obvious reasons from a personal and emotional level. Back to business, you want as many different people on your team so that you know you have different perspectives. Like if you want to just talk about straight cash, homie, <laughs> T.O., quote, it's more about having people, more variety of people on your team so that you have different perspectives. You know, just think if Corn Pops didn't, if Corn Pops would have had, you know, maybe more people on their marketing team, they wouldn't have sent out that Corn Pops box years ago with the only brown Corn Pops, Pops person as the janitor. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that's a huge gaffe, right? So that's a track. So that's, that's one thing that you could do. Maybe get a culture club together, try to rewrite your culture statement. You know, with hiring, I would say, uh, you know, a, a good one is, oh yeah, this is a simple one. This is more probably along the lines of, in, in, in your wheelhouse of facilitation. Do not, by all means, do an interview with, and I'm sorry to say this, Owl Labs, because you have an awesome product. But uh, it feels awkward. Don't do an interview with your team with at a conference table and the employee remote. I understand the... You know, I think this cam, Owl Labs camera is the best. I'm now, now I can't get it out of my head. It's an unbelievable product, in my opinion. You know, it kind of jumps around to the person that's speaking and the camera shows the whole room and it kind of goes back and forth. It's super cool. Like, I would suggest it for any agency that has multiple boardrooms in different places that are meeting and talking. But um, when you have an interview E, their first impression and they're, and they're trying to talk with you and you're at a conference room table with eight of your colleagues side by side, there's already an us versus them experience. So it's, it's already i uh, I'm here and you're there. So my suggestion is just get everybody on zoom or whatever video, whatever videos uh, system you're using. Um, equality, it's about the same. So put everyone on the same, the same call, the same platform, the same camera, everybody the same. Yeah. You know, I, I've said that for years, that, like if we're facilitating and someone's remote, everyone should be remote because we want to level the playing field. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to empathize if we're not all experiencing what everyone else is uh, or what, you know, the, those few individuals are experiencing. And it reminds me of all hands meetings where years and years ago, where people would dial into it. And then I thought to myself, what is, you know, what is it like to, to, to actually dial into one of these things? So I dialed into one and it was, I mean, you, I couldn't hear anything. I mean, it was, it was like, so tall, so tall. and then you'd hear, you'd hear people talking like that and you'd think, oh, I don't know, I don't even know what anyone's saying. Um, and maybe every now and then you could make out a few like important things the CEO said, but definitely didn't hear any questions or any dialogue. Um, and it's like really not great. And so, um, I I love that point of like, kind of let's level the playing field. Yeah. Yeah. So then, um, for onboarding, so you're kind of talking about Google docs and, and, and stuff, but like for onboarding, simple solution, like you got to have a place where, someone's going to learn about the organization. You know, believe it or not, a lot of companies don't have a moment to hear the origin story. Like, you know, we talked about my origin story earlier. And to a lot of people that, you know, I may fast forward it, but like, hey, I love the rep Bangor. Like, you know, there's an emotion to why a business got started. You know what I mean? There's 
something outside of there's a story. And if people don't know that story, then they may not understand what it is, you know, what are the values that are driving the organization? So to me, you know, I know onboarding is not the initial, it's not the first uh, interaction with the agency. You know, it's not even where first opinions happen, you know, because it's in the third, it's in the third step or in the third step, right? I mean, we understand that, you know, your first impression is definitely the job description. I mean, let's not... You know, people are looking for jobs. The first impression is the job description. Then they go on your website. But when you're onboarding, this is kind of like the first time that employees get to interact or participate. You know, this is the first time that uh, the individual is participating. So this is a really, really, really crucial, you know, moment to let them know what that origin story is and what let them know what values are driving your, your, your organization. So my, m- one of my first recommendations is, is just record a video of the founder. I mean, it, it doesn't even have to be crazy, you know, just record a video of when, when, when the founder got the idea for the business and why the founder started it. And then maybe a little bit about what drives the company? Because right now, COVID-19, if you have to let go of 20 people, or maybe you know you have a staff of 100 and you got to let go of 20 or 30 people, those other people that are there, they go through all sorts of emotions. Never mind the people that, are, that, are, that you let go, but the people that are staying there are going through some stuff. They lost some friends that are no longer employed, a little bit of uncertainty about the future. If all your employees know what drives you, even during uncertain times, a lot of these anxieties that that make people nervous and get people looking for other options will be erased. So onboarding is is so critical. And I can't give away all my secrets. So I would say the video is something simple. If you don't have a quick little video that somebody can watch or even like, you know, a couple paragraphs, how you got started and why you got started. And then what drives you? I, and I know people use the word values all the time. I'm trying to use different words than mission and vision and all that stuff. But like what what drives you, your company? Yeah. And I would a couple of things I would add there. You know, it's like so many companies talk about values and and, you know, they, even in the job description, they'll describe things that are aspirational and not, not mm-hmm. necessarily, you know, they're not really conveying the fact that we are that culture that's working like 60, 80 hours a week. And, and if you plan to retain people and you're right. doing that, you should be pretty honest about it up front, right? <laughs> yes. Rather than tricking people into coming in. And then, yeah. and then the, the same thing with values, right? If, if, um, if they're just some words that we adopted, cause they sound like stuff that, you know, you Hard put on working. values. Um, no. yeah, it's like, go getter. I mean, like, what in, is that? Integrity. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is that? <laughs> what is that? So if you can make them yeah. authentic, then um, I think people are going to resonate with those. And if they're shared values that they hold, then it can get people really excited. Yeah. So I think that's really yeah. great. And one thing that I saw a company do here in Austin, I've always been a fan of, is they created a scavenger hunt. And essentially new employees were given the scavenger hunt. And the cool thing about the scavenger hunt was that it included different aspects of the company's history the way that they were uh you know they got to the answers or found the these things they would have to go talk to other employees and other departments and so they got to to know so much about the way the company worked the the way the company had evolved over time Mm -hmm. and they made friends and connected and and it was very participatory so i i love it because it's like and it's almost like it's like a facilitator's like dream to do those kinds of things and so if more companies could institute these types of more uh, participatory uh, onboarding uh, practices i think you start to get into you know what we talk about as facilitated leadership i love that idea you're definitely gonna have to send me some maybe you can remember the company and send me some stuff on that. I, I think that's a great great idea um 
So then, yeah, so then you have engagement, and there's a million different ideas for engagement. One thing that I love for remote work that, I don't know, maybe this is more on performance. So in, engagement, you got to keep your, your remote workers engaged. So, you know, do you host an annual retreat? Do you host a quarterly retreat? Um, you know, how many do you have? You know, I don't want to say uh, happy hour, but that's 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 no good. You know, the link to the Zoom happy hours have been pretty tiring of late. Oh, on engage. This is my tip for engage. Uh, something very simple. Ask your employees how they're feeling. Like literally, you could not imagine how many companies just don't send a very simple employee engagement survey out to their employees. Like you would, all of us consultants in HR are like, yo, stop talking clean. But like the fact that you just don't do that, it's so easy. Just, just write like, and the other thing that, that, that um, I would suggest is if you're going to use a survey, if you're going to have a survey, you got to have a plan of what you're going to do with the data. So come up with a very simple survey and I would say, ask that question, ask that survey the exact same time next year so that you can have some sort of benchmarks. You know, doing a survey for no reason, you need to be able to have some data. And I actually suggest surveying people frequently. There's a lot of great survey software out there, like, uh, I don't know, was it Office Vibe, Culture Amp, all of these uh, softwares that send random questions to employees. You may not have that software or the budget for that. But you can come up with a very easy survey monkey or Google Google Forms with you know four or five questions and ask your employees every every quarter, you know, and they could be the same questions. Maybe you'll find out that in the fall, you know, this one question is being answered and you're lower in this for some reason. Um, so for engagement, that would be my 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 one tip is you gotta ask your employees how they're feeling. Awesome. We've definitely covered the gamut from, you know, uh, starting off with a good impression on job descriptions, you know, making sure we're thinking about that human connection in, in the remote landscape, the taxonomy, like making sure we think about what bucket we're in, what is our style of remote work and how can our approaches and tactics be tuned to be appropriate for our style all the way through to making sure that we are engaging folks and um, and even understanding how they're feeling, especially in this time of, you know, uh, a global pandemic that can be um, damaging morales and stuff. So, well, wow, covered a ton and it's been a, a blast thinking about all this stuff, um, Kaleem. And I know that the listeners are probably curious how they can connect with you, learn more, um, maybe in with a little bit of um, around how they can find you. Yeah, sure. Um, you can find me personally anywhere, Colleen Clarkson, K A L E E M C L A R K S O N. So I'm at Colleen Clarkson on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, and you can find our company at blendmeinc.com um, and also Remotely One if you're a remote uh, location independent professional and you're feeling the, the, the pains of isolation and loneliness and you, you want to still kind of build your network, come join Remotely One. We're a members only community for location imp- independent professionals. So you can find us at remotelyone.com or at Remotely One. And uh, yeah, I guess if there was something that I wanted to kind of sign off on, um, I guess that would be, let's not all go back if there was a piece of advice that I could give to organizations out there, don't go back to the way it was before COVID-19 just because. So let me repeat that. Don't go back to business before COVID-19. Go, don't go back just because. And what I mean by that is take this time as an opportunity to further develop your organization to be prepared for other disaster contingencies. They're going to happen. You know, if you're up in New England, you deal with the snow, 
Midwest, you deal with the snow. I mean, there are disasters all the time, hurricanes. Remote work, as you all have noticed, can help you make it through those, those times. So take this time to figure out how you can be better when you go back, when we go back to the, the, the quote unquote new normal. And maybe think about how you can reuse your space or reuse some of the things that you used to do before. So let's just not go back to the way it was before COVID-19. Kaleem, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Come back anytime. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Control the Room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. And if you want more, head over to our blog where I post weekly articles and resources about working better together voltagecontrol.com.